Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to present about this work. Um, I had a quick look at the ACT Early website earlier this morning, and it seems that there's quite a lot of opportunity to do this kind of work. So I hope what I'm going to tell you now is, is going to be um, useful to you. Um, so natural experiments evaluations, why do we do them and how do we make them better? Uh, aside from ACT Early and the kind of stuff I'm doing, at the moment, we're living in one big natural experiment, uh, that is the COVID-19 pandemic. So I decided not to discuss that because I'm sure everybody already hears more than enough about COVID. Um, so I just wanted to start and bring it back to the beginning. What, what do we try to do and why do we do this and how? Uh, first, I have to say that this is based on a paper we published um, earlier this, this year. Um, and it's public, uh, it was done together with um, several co-authors, and, and, and I just want to acknowledge that so this is not just my thoughts and my work, but also, also theirs. And I've used several examples from, um, uh, from a, a blog I found which nicely described a whole set of natural experiments, and I've extracted some of those uh, generally more well-known examples as, as illustrations for this, this presentation. So first, if we start with the basics, um, if we want to know if an intervention or a, uh, a new policy, for example, um, if that works or if that has an effect, we're, we've always been told to use, uh, to think about a randomized experiment with a control group. So a randomized control trial, which is considered as the gold standard. Uh, the idea, and I assume everybody knows that, but just, just to have a complete picture, is that um, randomization in principle resolve in two comparable groups and comparable in, in measured, but also unmeasured factors, which is quite an important issue to realize. And if we do that, we can think of it from a potential outcomes framework and we can either, we can interpret any effect that we found as, as causal. So, so that all sounds very good and we should all do this, except um, sometimes it's not a very good idea. Um, and it, in relation to public health and environmental health, for example, very often this is not a very good idea. Um, for example, it's impossible. So how do you randomize building in a new nuclear power station, for example? Um, the intervention or event has already happened. So, so uh, we didn't anticipate the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, we have to do this retrospectively. So we can't randomize even if we wanted to randomize. Um, or it's ethically dubious. Um, so for example, what's the impact of increasing local air pollution to above regulatory limits to see if that has a negative impact on, on public health. So in those situations, we have to come up with some other idea. So natural experiments and quasi experiments are generally considered that one of those other ideas. Um, if we look at the dictionary of epidemiology, it describes naturally occurring circumstances um, where the population can be divided in different levels of exposure and the presence of, of persons in a particular group uh, is typically non-random, non so it's not randomized, but for a natural experiment, um, it, it's, it's enough that um, they're probably unrelated to potential confounders. So that's the official definition, but we'll see in the next couple of slides that that's something that's not actually have them um, used that often. Um, but if we start from this, this definition, so this would be a very good example of a natural experiment, uh, a natural cause, uh, an act of God, so you will. And this describes um, a study of, of an, a major earthquake in Christchurch in 2011, um, which um, was very unfortunate, obviously, uh, for everybody involved, but fortunately, included a birth cohort with 35 years of follow-up um, with people born in Christchurch and a group of them moved away uh, and a group of them continued to stay to live in, in, in Christchurch itself. So you have an exposed and an unexposed group um, who all completed a mental health interview and what you could find if you compare these two groups that there was a higher rate of mental disorders um, in the exposed group than in the inexposed group. So, so that has the, the nice, methodologically speaking, advantage of, of randomizing uh, 
the birth cohort to um, either of the two states for evaluation. A more well-known example, probably the most well-known example is that from John Snow and the Broad Street Fund, or the Kohler um, um, epidemic. So the hypothesis was that cholera spread through uh, contaminated water and the intervention to, to look at was one company, uh, the, the Lambeth Water Company, uh, who mo moved their source of water upstream uh, to uh, uncontaminated water versus another company who, who con continued to draw it from the Thames and, um, and which was contaminated. So the outcome was the number of cholera deaths be be between these two companies over a certain period. And I, I'm not gonna go into the, the results themselves because I think they're pretty well known and easy to find if you're interested. But the main point is from John Snow's writing, he describes uh, that the mixing of the water supply was, was quite important here. Um, so some houses were supplied by one company and, and some by the other, according to nothing else but the decision of the owner or the occupier. Um, so in many cases, a single house um, has a different supply than the house next to it. Um, and as a result, each company supplied both rich and poor people and, and various other um, uh, characteristics were, were similarly randomized. Um, and there's no difference either in the condition or occupation of the people um, receiving the water. So what John Snow concluded is that no experiment could have been devised which would be more thoroughly test the effect of water supply on the program of cholera than the one that was naturally, uh, that had naturally occurred. And this is something that we'll get into in a second, and it's called uh, to do it as if randomization. And a more recent example uh, that I've been involved in is, is uh, the ban of smoking in cars uh, in England, which was um, implemented in England in 2015 and in Scotland in 2016. Um, and we looked at a different, we used a difference and differences framework. And if you look at the, the picture, what you can see is that the exposure of uh, um, children in cars is going down in both Scotland and England, but, in, but over the period of, of that ban, it suddenly ran down quite a bit in England, but not in Scotland, which gives us a bit more uh, confidence that, that the effect we found, so a, uh, about a 4% reduction um, in, in tobacco smoke exposure is, is truly the effect of that ban and not, not from something else that occurred at the same time. So if we then think about natural experiments again, or quasi-experiments, I'll get to the difference in a minute, you can think about that in two different ways as an analytic approach. So you basically say we have a set of statistical methods to analyze uh, a change in exposure. And if we use any of these methods, we, uh, we're talking about a natural experiment. Or you can say, well, actually, this is a distinct study design. And I'd like to argue for that second definition. So I'm only going to use one slide for the first definition, which is just a set of, of well-known up to lesser known statistical methods to analyze um, these kind of changes in exposure from pre-post designs and, and propensity scores to synthetic controls and instrumental variables. Um, that's a whole, well, each of these things is a whole presentation in itself. So I just wanted to put them out there. So you have an, an overview of how they're generally analyzed. But I think the more interesting bit of, of these kind of studies is a distinct study design. And if we have a look at where to place that. So, so this is a, a standard thing of overview of how we define different studies. So um, is the uh, intervention assigned, yes or no? And then we move to experimental studies and observational studies. Um, if an experimental study is random allocated, we, we have a randomized controlled trial. But the, the natural experiment or the quasi-experiment is placed in the middle of those. So it's effectively something that has both properties of an, of an experimental study and it has properties of an observational study, um, which also in, in terms of potential to make causal claims puts it, puts it somewhere in between an observational study and a, um, and a randomized controlled trial. So that's uh, quite a strength um, in terms of how you, how you interpret the results of these kinds of studies. We identified four different conceptualizations, um, and I, I apologize that that's a bit of a Dutch slide, 
but we, I know you now realize I forgot to change that. Um, but um, there's four different conceptualizations in the literature of how this works. So, so the most famous thing is Shadish Cook and Campbell, who, who wrote a textbook on these kind of things. And they say if if you're looking at a natural occurring event, you're looking at a natural experiment. If X is an intervention, you're looking at a quasi experiment. And that's how they define the difference between the two and, and separate them from observational studies and RCTs. Um, Tad Dunning, who wrote a textbook on natural experiments, defines it quite a bit differently and says, well, it's all to do with the, the randomization of this. If, if it's plausible as if random, and we'll get to that in a minute, how, how, how you think about that, it's a quasi-experiment. Um, sorry, if it's a, a weak plausibility, it's a quasi-experiment. But if you can make a very strong case that it's basically as if somebody randomized it, um, then you're talking about a natural experiment. Um, and another definition is by Raimler and Risen, who um, define the difference between whether something just happens, um, in which case it's a natural experiment, um, if the exposure is exogenous, or, or if X is an intervention to change something, it's a, a quasi-experiment, and then you can split that up in, in weak and strong quasi-experiments depending on whether the exposure is self-selected or not. So that's kind of akin akin to the first definition of Shadis and, and colleagues. And then finally, the MRC um, has basically said, well, this is all uh, very theoretical. What we're going to say is um, if you analyze an event or an intervention that you can't randomize, uh, it's a natural or a quasi experiment. Uh, and we can use these, these terms um, um, we can both use these terms and they mean the same thing. And the strength of that is depending on whether X is, so the exposure is endogenous or can be considered as exogenous. Um, so that's the four definitions of, of how, how this is, is used, regardless of which definition you use. And I think the MSC one is, is the easiest one because we don't have to go into these distinctions, uh, at least not in this presentation. Um, if we look at the strength of this, so why are, are they a good idea? So, so natural experiments can, can generate causal evidence when RCTs are possible. They can have a high internal validity uh, and they can have a high external validity because they're, they're set in a real world in a way. So, so the kind of results we find are applicable to uh, a non-controlled environment, in a way, which, makes, which can make them more useful than, than RCTs. And they can be fast, low cost, um, and retrospective, which is uh, quite um, use, using existing data, which is quite important. And it's possible because you can use routine data uh, to look at long-term effects and something that generally isn't possible for RCTs. Um, the limitations are basically to do with the fact that they are not randomized. So there is, continues to be a higher risk of bias. Um, very often they're discovered rather than planned, uh, and, and you find something has changed, say, in, a, in an urban environment, and you'd like to evaluate that retrospectively. So there is an element of luck involved and an element of reliance on data being available. Um, and the intervention may not well be, not, not be well defined, which, which happens quite, quite a bit. It's very difficult to dis determine who the exposed population and who the unexposed population is. For so if we, if we think about natural experiments a bit more and see how we can appraise them. So Ted Dunning wrote uh, a book about um, natural experiments in the reference to the bottom of the slide. And he proposed an evaluation from framework along three axes, uh, the plausibility of assay for randomization, the credibility of the causal and statistical models, and the relevance of the intervention or the policy. Now, I'm not going to talk about the third one, the, the relevance of the intervention of policy, because that's something very specific to each, each natural experiment you, you, you would be looking at or that you'd be doing. Um, so, so first, the plausibility of as if randomization. Um, so the idea behind it is the causal inference can be strengthened by clear appraisal of the likelihood of 
as if random allocation of exposure. And the, and the idea is basically, does it look like this was random despite the fact researchers didn't um, allocate the exposure themselves? Um, it requires variables that determine the treatment assignment, that these are exogenous, which means um, they're strongly correlated with the treatment status, but they're not caused by the outcome of interest. So we have to make sure that there's no evidence of um, or no idea of reverse causality, and they have to be exogenous, so independent of any other causes of the outcome of interest. Um, there's no real way to determine whether this is the case. Um, so, so it's an argument uh, you have to make when you do these kinds of evaluations along a, a, along a continuum of plausibility. Uh, and that argument is, is quite important for the strength of, of, of with which you can make causal claims. And they're both based on empirical evidence. So for example, the, the comparison between exposed and unexposed at baseline covariance, which you would normally do anyway, but also very much based on, on, on domain knowledge. So in that respect, it's, it's really important because you need this additional layer of justification uh, based on domain knowledge. That if you do these kind of studies in the, in the context of public health, uh, it's, it's important to evolve practitioners and, and for example, also local community if you can, because they will have a much better idea of whether this could be random or not. So a good example of a, a as if randomized experiment is the Oregon health insurance experiment. Um, it's one of the um, most well-known natural experiments in, in recent years in public health. And it examined the impact of access to Medicaid and, and basically what happened was uh, in 2008, they opened the waiting list for this program uh, after it had been closed for a number of years. Um, and approximately 90,000 people signed up for 10,000 available places. So what the, the state did, the state of Oregon was, they just randomly drew them out, um, out of a, uh, uh, well, they did, just did a lottery uh, to get to these 10,000 people. And you, you can appreciate that that's pretty much like random, like if researchers would have randomized this. Um, and then they compare the outcomes of the 30,000 people who received Medicaid against those um, uh, 28 who, who didn't. And they found a, a set of uh, you know, differences between both of the groups that are, that are not that, that relevant for the current talk, but basically showed that there are uh, clear benefits to um, to receiving Medicaid. Another example where you can start to think about is this is this as if random or not is uh, something a bit closer to, to my heart because I'm originally from the Netherlands and it has to do with the uh, second, second World War and the Dutch hunger winter which took place towards the end of um, the end of the world uh, the World War. Um, in which the, the south and the east bit of the Netherlands um, had been liberated, but the west hadn't yet. And um, um, the occupying forces extracted a lot of the food, etc., out of the, uh, that area. So the official food rations dropped to, to about 500 calories per day. And this was a, one of the only examples of a modern advanced country experiencing a short, a short and sharp famine. So the exposed is the west of the country, the unexposed are the north and the south. And, and, and the idea is to examine the differences uh, on population health by comparing people from these regions. And the, and the underlying idea, which is never spoke, is never discussed in that much detail, but it's basically, are people in the west similar to those in the south and the, um, in the north? Um, I, I can make a case that they are, I can make a case that they aren't. Um, but this gets a bit more in the discussion, is, is, is this as if randomized or not? Um, so they were uh, particularly interested in, in children in utero at the time of the famine. And if you're interested in this, um, there's, there's a, a whole book written about that with the reference uh, provided. Now, one of the things to do with natural experiments that I'll get into in a second is, is to try and get similar results from similar kind of events is if they both say the same thing, um, 
then it's very likely that you're looking at a causal effect as a result of this, in, in this case, a short or a sharp famine. And indeed there is. So they looked at the Chinese famine during the Great Leap Forward in the 1950s, 1960s, and, and you find the same kind of impacts on, on, on development and, and health, which, which tells you a lot about what these kind of uh, famine events do in, in, in terms of health and mental health and, and development. But then a third example where, where as if randomization is even a bit more questionable is a study I've been involved in that looked at the impact of um, the closure of two co-located premises, a restaurant and a cocktail bar in November 2016 in, in Bristol, uh, following a license review by the police um, at the grounds of, of crime and disorder. And, and so that place was closed. Um, so ha we had time series data of antisocial behavior and crimes in the immediate, need, in the immediate area of that. Um, and we um, came up with three control areas, four control areas um, that were determined to be comparable based on discussions with local practitioners. Um, for reference, we found little evidence of impact, but, but it's, what, what's more of interest is, is, is this as if random? Um, the area where this place was, was Park Street, the blue arrow, and then there were three comparable areas in the city, um, for the, maybe of interest for those familiar with, with Bristol. Um, but here you can argue, yes, you know, this is, these are comparable controls. So, so the intervention, the closure was basically as if randomized, but equally, uh, we're not 100% sure. So it's a weaker case of as if randomization than with the other examples. And it's really important to discuss these things when you're de developing a natural experiment or when you're reporting on them in, in subsequent uh, reports or papers. So that was the bit about as if randomization. The second bit is the credibility of causal and statistical models. And to do that, we have to go back and think about what is it we want to do. So we use natural experiment evaluations with the aim of estimating causal um, causal effect on, uh, amongst everybody or just to treat it of an inst intervention, which is basically the same you're trying to do with an RCT. Uh, we make a distinction between an exposed and an unexposed or intervention and control period, just like an RCT again. The RCT is considered as the gold standard. So what we're trying to do is we're trying, basically trying to em emulate a, a trial as, as, as good as we can. Um, to make as strong a causal claim as we can. So can we use this idea um, in the design to, to improve the design and the appraisal of natural experiment studies uh, and to make, it, make some kind of inference on, on how good each of these studies is? So that's something that exists already. That's called the target trial framework developed by uh, Miguel Hernan. Um, and it's basically, uh, we look at the target trial of um, what, would, what would we want to do had it been possible to do an actual randomized control trial. Um, and they developed a, a protocol of a target trial describing seven components common to, to RCT, so the eligibility criteria, the treatment strategies, the assignment procedure, follow-up period, the outcome, the causal contracts of interest, contrast of interest and the analysis plan. And our idea is to link all of the, all of the characteristics of your natural experiment evaluation uh, in, in this particular case um, to each of those criteria and see where the strengths are, where they match very well and where the weaknesses are. And you can use that similarly to, to then come up with some improvements to try and make it better. Um, so in the design phase, uh, deviations from the target trial in each domain can be used to evaluate where improvements and where concessions will have to be made. And in reporting and appraisal, it provides a very structured way of reporting um, strengths of weaknesses and, and so facilitates the comparison of different natural experiment studies in any, any future evidence synthesis. So in the, in the paper, um, I referenced in the beginning, we, we, did, the, we did that for um, uh, natural experiment studies. So we had all the protocol components um, described by Hanan and his colleagues. And we put all the specifics in, 
uh, please don't try to read this on the slide, but, but just have a look at the paper afterwards if you're interested. Um, with specific con concepts to theorize the causal contrasts and, and um, to consider various things, and then some recommendations to, th to strengthen causal claims. And you can go through these for each of your interventions uh, and natural experiment studies if you want. So if we just, as a, by way of illustration, look at the first one, which is to do with the eligibility criteria. So it, it basically just dis discusses, can you uh, uh, describe or make sure you describe the, both the exposed and the unexposed population uh, really well, make, and have a look at boundaries of the interventions and where they overlap or not overlap with routine data, for example. Um, have a think about independence of, of uh, exposure and a discussion of uh, spillover effects. So, so the issue, for example, if you if you close all the all the bars and pubs in a certain area in the city, and you want to um, evaluate the impact of that on crime, then you run the risk that all the punters go to the nearby areas. And so the crime spills over in the next area. And if that's a control, you get a, an overestimation of a, of a true effect. Uh, and then discuss any potential issues of collider bias or other forms of selection bias. Um, to improve the causal claims with respect to this particular criteria, uh, what you could do is uh, make sure you have multiple control, control groups. And ideally, they have to differ in some kind of consequential way. Uh, so, for example, comparable groups of areas or, or other geographical locations to conduct additional sensitivity analysis. Um, and if they all point in the same direction, then that's an important uh, thing to know, really. And it gives you more strength in, your, in the claims you want to make. So that whole table, if I summarize that in what I believe are the main things to think about the natural experiments, uh, it's to make sure that you use multiple control groups of conditions, uh, which feeds directly into uh, eligibility criteria, assessment criteria, outcomes, and the analysis, natural experiment conditions. Can you expect any pre-intervention changes? And that's something we'll discuss in a, in a second. Um, try and include multiple outcomes, especially if, you're, if, you, if it's possible to include positive and negative controls. Um, assess different outcomes, the different follow-up periods for the outcome and see if there's any evidence of pulse impacts. And I'll, I'll have a look at that uh, with you in a couple of slides. And very important, conduct falsification tests. So temporal and, and falsification and spatial falsification. So the next thing, the last bit in this presentation that I'd like to do is go through some of these and just show you, show you some illustrations of what they mean. So for example, this is a study done by colleagues of mine about the impact of um, pesticide exposure um, in Sri Lanka and suicide. And you see clear dips every time a, uh, a ban was introduced. So, so since that happens at different points of time, exactly where you would expect these drops in the rates, you can say, well, that makes me more confident that there is a, a causal relation between the exposure pesticides and the, um, the effects of suicide rates. That's temporal validation. So they did the same study somewhere else. Um, and in this case, uh, I forgot where this was, but in one of the neighboring countries, uh, showed the same thing in one paraquat, some type of pesticide was uh, um, more def difficult to get. You saw a drop in, in, in suicide rates. And that shows the same result as I showed earlier with the, um, the Dutch hunger winter and, and the Chinese great leap forward. Uh, this, that spatial validation, so if you see the same things in different, different areas of the world in this case, it, it, it tells you that you're probably um, talking about a causal relation. A form of pre-intervention anticipation is quite important. So this is a study uh, where they looked at the the um, impact of the UK soft drinks uh, in, uh, leave levy. So, uh, and they were interested in whether when, when the sugar tax is what it basically is, when that came in, in March 2000, uh, sorry, in, in, which was announced in March 2016 and implemented in 2018, whether that had an impact um, 
on the consumption of, of drinks. And what they found is quite interesting. So there was no change in this number of soft or the volume of soft drinks purchased. So, so it hadn't, didn't have any effect in that respect. But what it did do was um, to avoid that, this tax, um, many producers reduced the amount of sugar in their drinks. So over, by and large, you did see an effect on the, on the actual amount of, of sugar that was consumed in that period, which tells you that it worked, but not by the way you anticipated um, when you did the analysis. So, so these kind of, especially by industry, these kind of uh, anticipation behavior is quite important to think about. Um, then something about follow-up and, uh, and pulse impact. So, so this relates back to the study I mentioned earlier, the closure of pubs. And we looked at another uh, impact of the closure of a specific nightclub. Um, and we looked at individual clubs just to see if, um, if we could look at that small spatial level. Uh, so this club closed in 2013, and we were interested in antisocial behavior. And we found, if you look at the top bit, we found very little impact over a 12-month period. Um, but when we looked at shorter time periods, we found that actually there was quite a significant drop uh, when that place closed. So people would either, well, go somewhere else or, um, or stop causing trouble as a result of that, the, the, the way that club was organized. Um, but it only lasted for four years and uh, for four months, and slowly the effect came back to what it was pre, uh, pre intervention, so pre closure of that club. So that's quite an, an interesting uh, uh, pulse impact of this, which averted about 60, 60 incidents overall, but not any longer, longer sustaining effects. The next thing I wanted to il illustrate is falsification tests. Um, so, we, so we looked at this. Uh, from different perspectives. One was we artificially uh, programmed an earlier intervention and a later intervention, and, and we saw very little effect of any impact, um, which is important. So it tells us that that time point was important when the club closed. And similarly, when we artificially made one of the control areas a case area, as if a club had closed, it hadn't closed, we similarly found very little evidence of an impact. Uh, telling us that we are probably looking at, at a causal association between closure of that club and short impact. So that was kind of what I wanted to discuss about uh, natural experiment evaluations, just to take home messages that natural experiment evaluations have strength and limitations. So they're, they're useful where randomization is not possible. They can be done retrospectively. And stronger causal claims compared to observation studies can be made because there's a change in exposure that you specifically analyze, which is quite important. But you have to realize that although your case for SF randomization could be really strong, it's still not an RCT. So we can never prove that, that, that's, that that's the case, um, which is similarly something to always keep in mind when you look at these, these kind of studies. The target trial framework provides a systematic method for designing and evaluating these, these kind of studies. And advice when you do them or when you appraise them is to always describe or discuss the ASIF randomization and the strength of that argument. Where possible, always use a control group and where possible, use multiple control groups, uh, ideally with those that differ in some systematic way. Uh, and include falsification tests to make sure you're looking at the, the correct thing. That's what I had to say about this. I just wanted to say one last slide that we, as in the School for Public Health Research, have set up a network for the use of natural experiments in public health. And this link brings you to the website. And um, this was initially only for SBXR people. Uh, we are now opening up more broadly uh, to other people. We have a next event. July 12th, um, where a uh, uh, recently promoted Dutch academic is telling us about her work on, on, um, on natural experiments of, of, of local interventions in, in green space and uh, etc. In, in, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And if you're interested in, in that, please just drop me an email and you can and I'll give you the link to, to register for that.
thank you very much. That's all I have to say. I hope that was um, of interest and feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you so much, Frank. That was really interesting. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. I have a few. But does anyone have any burning questions? Yet? Well, I'll, oh, here we go from Rachel. Um, a very elegant solution to messy real world data. And from a meta-analysis point of view, is there a kind of stigma around using natural experiments to identify causal relations? Rachel, do you want to expand on that point? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Sorry. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm really new to natural experiments. Um, and um, I have a medical background, um, but I've just started uh, working with the Better Start Hub. Um, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around these sorts of things. So. Uh, a lot of the experiments that I've seen um, reported around sort of natural experiment studies um, have been things like uh, the New Zealand earthquake, or um, I think there was some stuff around resilience in children that have experienced certain really sort of uh, things that you can't, you can't deny are very, very big events. Um, and in the UK, as you probably know, we've got quite a lot of uh, social inequality across the country that causes um, or is well linked to health outcomes. Um, and what I'm really interested in is whether or not there's um, any difficulty in using sort of this methodology to sort of look at the causal relations between these two things, because they sort of inherently tie with a lot of social and political issues. Uh, I know that's a really broad question, but I'd be really interested to know sort of from your experience, so, so your experience um, how you sort of see those issues um, and whether or not there's any sort of advice that you have, I suppose. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a really good question and an important question as well, because that's the kind of stuff that we kind of more generally deal with compared to things like a pandemic or an earthquake, I'd say. Um, so it's, and, and traditionally, I think in, in epidemiology world um, or public health world, it was because it's quite dominated by the by medical paradigm, it was either an RCT, if you want to say something causal, or, or an observational study, if, if you shouldn't say anything causal, but you still did. And that's kind of the, the distinction. Uh, and these natu natural experiment evaluations come from economics, where they've been doing this for, for quite a while, um, comparing countries, etc. cetera. And, uh, and, and they are now starting to gain more traction in public health as well, and, and funders, in my experience, um, are more susceptible to to these kinds of designs as well. So I, I would definitely consider them um, as a way of doing this. The the social so so the, the particular problem you mentioned on on social inequalities etc. Uh, what happens what what can happen quite a bit with natural experiments is that people are actually just doing an observational study. So for example, comparing trends over time in, in, in uh, between areas um, in say changes in IMD scores and, and outcomes. That's not a natural experiment evaluation, but it's very often batched as one because of the variation in exposure between areas. The, re the, the thing, if you want to do this and where its particular st strength would lie is if you can identify say areas where there is a sudden change in exposure from high to low or from low to high, and use that as the starting point of the design of an evaluation, because that, then, you, then you use the strength of this, the change in exposure on subsequent outcome to be more confident that there is a, a real um, association between the two. Rather, sorry, rather than, than say, an association that could be artificial uh, because, because you just do an observational analysis between different areas with possibly unmeasured differences that could also explain this. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thanks, Frank. Um, 
I wondered about the plausibility and point the as if randomized. And I wondered if you could go into any more detail in how you went about choosing your comparator areas, your control areas. Um, you know, you could use it in the example of closing the bar. Um, you know, what, what methods did you use to select them? Yeah, so, so, so what we had was a, an area where this happened and we were interested in evaluating that particular closure. So what we did is we sat together with the, uh, this, this was pre-COVID times, so we sat together with um, the local uh, licensing and public health team and just had a discussion about this, is, this bar is located in a certain street. What, what small areas are comparable to that? So what in, throughout the city that have, a, in this case, a, you know, a, a bit of a, um, uh, a nightlife economy, but not, but are not the center of the city where everybody goes, and and then look a bit at uh, baseline levels of um, alcohol-related harm, for example, or alcohol-related crime, and see if those things kind of match. Um, and and we did it that way. Now, one of the things that made this, I haven't discussed, that made this comparison. Um, slightly stronger i think is that we then combined the the three or four control areas that we all thought were comparable but we realized there may be stuff going on that we didn't realize that um, that could confound that association so what we did was we combined the four of them in what's called a synthetic control and you make a one control area that doesn't exist but is in a way the best comparable area of um, of the intervention area that you're interested in. So we did one extra step to make it more comparable than the three different or four different individual areas. That sounds, that sounds really, really neat, actually. Is it, is it something that's an accessible method for those of us more new to natural experiments or it's perhaps something more specialist. Yeah, it's it's not so. So there is a package in R that that, that kind of does that. That's, and if you were to use all the defaults of that package, it's not massively complicated to do. Okay. Um, I think the package for those interested is just called causal impact. Okay. Uh, so, so so it's very neat methodologically. It's very nice in terms of causality. It's very difficult difficult to sell to practitioners or the general public because you have to start talking about imaginary intervention areas that don't exist but kind of would have but but they would be the counterfactual area had the intervention not happened so it makes it makes communication quite difficult um, and very often you get in discussions can you not just compare to the three of them and see if it's the same which is something you can also do, and it's easier to communicate, but possibly not as strong as, as, as that, um, that synthetic counterfactual. Thanks, that's helpful. Sorry, Tiffany. Sorry, Jessica. I was just going to ask whether you find that by engaging with local stakeholders and policymakers on doing one of these natural experiment studies that they are more receptive to uh, things like counterfactuals and synthetic controls, if they sort of, oops, sorry, if they're sort of discussed in the beginning along the way rather than explained at the very end once the studies have been completed. Yes, yeah, so, so what we did is first explain what we wanted to do before discussing the areas um, and say, this is how we want to combine them. So that's why we're looking at the best comparable controls areas, and then we also combine them in a second step. Um, and this is why we do that. So we did give a, a short presentation beforehand as to why we would be doing it that way. Um, one more question, Frank, are there any elephant traps that 
those of us more, you know, less climatized because it's such an attractive method, but, um, you know, where might we go wrong? Well, there's no big, big traps other than the standard traps, I would say, of any evaluation. Um, so it very much relies on defi defining that change in exposure. And what's very difficult sometimes, especially when you do say area area level interventions, is who who gets exposed and who who doesn't. So if you build a park and you're interested in the impact of green space, who's your control area? Because the people in in say neighboring areas will in likely also use um, use the same park and and so. And, and could you define a gradient of exposure or, or, or can't you really do that? And, and, and if everybody uses this park, then you, then you kind of have to use a control population in another city, for example, but how comparable is that? So, um, so yeah, so you get these, so, so I, thought, I think very good definition of everything from the start, both the exposure, the train, change in exposure, who your exposed population is and the control population solve, solves quite a, a bit. And the argument or a rationale for is this rem, as if random or, or not? I mean, the, that combination, I think, sets you up for, for a very good. And, well, and we developed that paper with the target trial thing for a reason. And so I would advise to go through that. Thanks. That's, that's a useful. I can see a question from Lena about yeah the overlap with covid lena do you want to ask that question um yeah just in terms of thinking about act early and and act early started in 2019 when most of the projects are only just starting or have started over the last year um i feel like covid happening at the same time <laughs> makes evaluating a lot of them quite challenging in terms of using this type of natural experiment um, methods, sort of, is there any way to, <laughs> any way to de deal with it? <laughs> that is a difficult question because that, that's one of the things to always think about. Has something else happened at the same time in either the intervention or the control area? And COVID is of course quite a big issue. Um, so, so I think, so the good thing in a way is that COVID happened in any exposed area as much as in any control area. Mm. But having said that, it's quite a lot of stuff can change. That may, so, so I was reading an argument the other day about you can use COVID as a natural experiment evaluation of the impact of a pandemic, which makes sense. But it's also being used to, for example, evaluate the impact of homeschooling because all children suddenly have to be homeschooled. And the argument was that that's a very bad shout because it's not a natural situation. And there's loads of stress related factors, um, issue with, 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 you know, with family members that have died, et cetera, that make this not a, not a, a good evaluation of, of homeschooling in itself, and I think the same thing applies to to your question. In theory, you can argue that COVID happened for both of these, for both intervention and control areas. So the difference between the two should be the effect of your intervention. But so much other stuff has happened, uh, and you don't know whether that's the same in both of your populations. That it will be really difficult. Um, yeah. So I'm afraid I don't have any <laughs> direct <laughs> solutions. Yeah, and, and the sort of outcomes that are relevant for ACT early will be things that COVID will um, most likely have quite an impact um, on as well. In terms of sort of uh, picking um, a comparison, so if we're looking at um, ACT early as a whole or any big sort of cluster of interventions where a whole area is being targeted 
um, it seems quite difficult to draw the boundaries of the intervention area. So if we class everything that's happening within Bradford and Tower Hamlets as um, act early, where, where do we sort of draw the line would be, <laughs> would be my question. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the things I discussed that is a difficulty with these area mm -hmm. level interventions. And, and it, it sounds very much as if using a control area from other areas in say Bradford is not a good idea. Yeah. So, so you'd have to find some kind of possibly you know, a couple of other areas um, that are kind of similar with respect to measured baseline characteristics. Mm. And what you could think about is then combining them in a, in a synthetic control um, type thing and, um, and create, say, an, an, an artificial counterfactual and, and do the comparison that way. Right. Thank you. That was very helpful. Are there any final questions or comments for Frank? But feel free if there are specific, sorry, if there's specific questions or things you'd like to discuss, including this counterfactual stuff, for example, feel free to email or tweet me. I'm happy to, to discuss. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I think I think one thing that's really helpful is to see this as part of an opportunity to link more closely and to join in with the SBHR activities too. Mm, that'd be great, yeah. Are you happy for us to send around um, the latest SPHR uh, seminar details for those who are interested, or would you rather that they contact you directly? Yeah, let me see if I can very quickly find a link to that, and you don't have to email me and 